Okay, we're going to uh, do two definitions today. I'm going to ask you guys some questions based upon what we talked about last chapter. Um, this quiz that we took was not a full test, of course. It was fit. It's, it'd be like a test that was worth is worth half as much. So it's like worth 50 points. So what I did is I put it on the grading program, and it counted it half as much as a test. Okay, so it would take two of these to make one normal test grade of what we've done in the past. So keep that in mind when you look at your grade. <clears throat> the grades were put in on Friday, so if you have an infant campus, you're able to check those out and look at those. This whole unit here is about bonding. And bonding is a major part of chemistry because the only way that... Uh, we can form a new substance when we have two or more substances put together, two or more different atoms put together, is by bonding. That's the only way. So the two major type of bonding is on that first page. They're real simple definitions. They don't get much simpler than those two definitions. Okay? Ionic bonding and covalent bonding. Now there's two types of covalent bonding that we're going to look at. There's what's called polar covalent, which means when these two atoms or more atoms bond together, they create a bipolar molecule. Bipolar molecule. Okay, bi... What do you think means by bipolar? Two polars. Two polars. Opposite, right? Like north and south pole. If you, take a look, if you look at a magnet, it's what? There, north and south, on there, and we know they're opposite. So it's kind of like a magnet. One side's going to be a little bit of a negative charge, and the other side's going to be a little bit of a positive charge. So they're called bipolar, okay? Because they're opposite charges on each end of that molecule, okay? Polar molecules. And then we have some that will be called nonpolar, where there's not any. There's not much difference between one side and the other when you look at their charges. Okay? Uh, the ionic bonding, uh, there's big difference in their charges, and so they don't, what we call, share, but there's an actual movement of an electron from one atom to the other, creating two opposite charged atoms. And this is a model here of something that we would model that would be an ionic structure. Okay? It's totally different look than from something that's covalent. Ionic looks totally different when we model it from something that is covalent or molecular. Okay? So this would be like covalent. If you notice, this is a uh, model of sodium chloride. And the chlorines are the styrofoam that's a little bit larger, and the sodium is the one that's a little bit smaller inside. And so, um, if you notice, there's usually for every one sodium, there's one chlorine. If we make this bigger, it would continue on in that, that ratio, one to one. So, uh, sodium chloride is NaCl, and the reason why is because it's uh, going to go together to where the charges bounce out, and we'll get to that much, we'll get to that later on this week. Okay? So, the two definitions we're going to take a look at are ionic bonding and covalent bonding. And those are the ones we're going to really focus upon. There's also metallic, but we don't really talk about metallic a whole lot. It's mostly ionic and covalent. So I'm going to put these two definitions down. We're going to talk a little bit about them. Um, I have some examples over here drawn out. You don't have to draw these out. This is just the visual to kind of show you what they look like. Okay, some different elements, and we'll talk about what those are, okay? So, ionic bonding. It's going to result... Um, due to the electrical attraction between a cation and an anion.
I did it in different order in the book, yeah. But basically the same thing. Chemical bonding that results between anions and cations due to electrical attraction. Okay? So we know anions are what charged? They are negative charged, right. Okay? What, uh, what elements on the periodic table are going to form anions? Left side minerals. Nope. Oh, no, anions. because they're going to lose one on the right side. Okay, so what do we consider the right side? What are those called? Non-metals. Non -metals. Okay. Then we know cations are opposite of that. They are positive. And they're pretty much going to be the ones that are considered metals. So here, here we have, for the most part, if you look at a compound and it has a metal and a non-metal in it, you can pretty much say that it's ionic bonding. You probably don't have to, to just memorize, hey, if I have a metal like calcium and I put it with a non-metal like oxygen, then I know it's probably going to be an ionic compound. And what happens is that metals tend to, are willing to give up some electrons up to a certain point. You guys remember what point do they not give up any more electrons? So we've got these elements here. We know they, they give up electrons. To what point will they stop giving up electrons, Hunter? Till they have like a non, like, till they get to a full shell. Yeah, and what are those elements at full shells? They have full subshells. Yep. Noble, noble gas. Oh, okay. So when they get to a noble gas configuration, they'll quit losing. Yeah. So they'll lose one, two, three. Some of them lose four, five, six, depending upon if we get into D's and that. We won't talk much about those. But uh, they tend to give up one, two, or three until they get to the noble gas. Where they don't, it's just too big of an energy is required to pull out that next <coughs> electron. Okay? Any questions on that? So those cations and anions, they'll attract one another. And they'll form what we call an ionic compound. And that attraction between those two is called ionic bonding. Okay? So we have this thing, next thing is called covalent bonding. That's the other major category. Now, both of these are chemical bonds. I didn't have you write the definition, but chemical bond is a mutual attract, electrical attraction between the nuclei and valence electrons of different atoms. So, just basically you're taking nuclei of atoms and they're able to attract one another either by ionic bonding, which is uh, opposite charged ions coming together, or by covalent bonding, which is not going to be the same. They're going to be where there is a more of a sharing and not a transfer of electrons, okay? So results from sharing of electron pairs. So here's my question to you. If there's sharing taking place, uh, one thing we know about these particular atoms that will form covalent bonds, they will not be willing to give up their electrons. One thing we know about them, they're not willing to give up electrons. Because if they're willing to give up electrons, then they'll probably form an ion like a cation. So these atoms will not want to give up electrons. And, but, and so the only way they can you know, get extra electrons from another atom 
is either to pull it from like a cation or to share it. So what elements are we talking about here that will probably form what we call covalent bonds because they both want electrons, both of these are competing for electrons and they don't want to give them up but they'll, they'll have to compromise and they'll have to share. So what group would that be? What do you think? What group would be willing to share? What do you think? Share what? The electron? Share the electron. They're not willing to give them up, so the only way they can compromise is to say, all right, we're not going to give up, I'm not going to give up my electron, you're not going to give up your electrons, let's, let's compromise and let's share that electron. What group is that? Along the Which one? Non-metals. So that would be when you have a non-metal bonded to a non-metal. That's where... Now, metals, they don't... You know, they're, they're two, one, two, or three electrons that have an arrow shell. They don't hold on too tightly to, they're not big on sharing. So covalent bonding is where both atoms want the electron and they're, you know, they will share. Um, now, sometimes they don't share equally. So. They'll share, but it's, you know, like you have maybe a gift that you were given to you by a grandparent or by your parents and say, all right, you guys need to find some way to share this so that you both can use it. So give me some examples of where there's a sharing taking place between you and maybe a brother or sister. You think something, Hunter? My mom, she put, like, so we had, like, two living rooms, and one with towers and one with batteries. And she put a TV in there, and she told us that we'd share it. And so I just took it over and sat on the couch. So, is, are you older than your sister? Yeah. How much older? Six years. So you have a TV that you share, but really she doesn't get to decide what's watched unless she's the only one there, right? Okay. So that's not a very equal sharing. That's really not sharing. That's kind of like I'm doing what I want to do. You just have to put up with it. Alec, do you have one? Money. Money? Then you would probably share that equally, though, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you got a gift card or something and say, you guys need to share this, yeah. you try to share it as equal as you can for the most part. Oh, are you talking about equal? No. Well, we can talk about equal sharing. Usually, if you got $100 and you need to split it between you and a sibling, you're going to take 50 and your sibling's going to take 50 That's an yeah. equal share. Yeah. So, we'll talk about equal shares, too. But that's an equal share. Where, where do we have an unequal share? That's, Hunter would be a good example of unequal. Yours would be probably an equal share. So you got $100, but you have three siblings. Right. I mean, if you want to, you can go down to the bank and say, hey, I want $33.33. That's pretty equal. I don't know. Flip for it, I guess. That's been a little bit goofy on that part. have to do a whack-a-mole tournament for you. <laughs> Who has an unequal share? I'm thinking of um, some other things, kind of like the computers. Anybody share computers in their family? Oh, no. To where you use them? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so sometimes there's unequal share of that because maybe I require classes that, that I'm taking. I need to get on there more, and so I'm going to have more hours of sharing that than somebody else. A car, another, another would be a car if you guys share a vehicle. Um, sometimes that's an unequal share because of age. So, covalent bonding doesn't have to be equal sharing. We don't have to have equal sharing. Okay? So, we have nonmetals bonded to nonmetals for that case. So, um, I want you to look on your folded periodic table and find electronegativity on the back side. Find electronegativity on the back side. There's a key, bottom left, till it has electronegativity on it.
should be the top right hand number in each of those boxes. So on the opposite side, it's the side that does not give um, doesn't give the name, it just gives the symbol. Okay? So give me some elements that have high electronegativities. What's the highest? Fluorine is 3.98. Okay, so fluorine, when it shares, it's never probably going to be equal share unless it bonds to itself. So if fluorine bonded to itself, then the sharing would be exactly equal. It would be perfect share. Because both of them would desire the electron the same amount, 3.98. Okay? Yep. Yeah, Krypton doesn't have one. Yes. Kindle. Okay, oxygen is 3.44. I think that's the next highest. So oxygen would be, if you want to share with oxygen and fluorine another element, you know you're not going to share it equally because both of those are going to have a high pull or high desire for electron pair. Why don't Okay, good question. The noble gas, if you look at the electron configurations up here, here's a noble gas configuration, and we'll just pick on a neon. Neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Okay, where, where's going to be the elect, where in that outer shell uh, is a location where an electron can come in? Nowhere. Nowhere. So, that's why they don't have electron negativities, because there's nowhere where an electron can come in and be shared. Okay, now here's fluorine, which is right next to neon, and it's, same configuration, but 2p5, and its orbital notation would look like the following. Okay, so look, it's got one location. The atom is really small for fluorine. So that electron, when it comes in, it comes in and gives off a lot of energy. Okay, it's got electron affinity, it gives off a lot of energy. But it's sharing here, and when it shares, let's see if I can do this. I bet you I can do this. No. Okay. When it shares, it pulls in another, this would be from another electron that's sharing, then it needs just that one, and then then it's full. Okay, but that sharing of that one, fluorine is a definite uh, high pull for that electron that's being shared. Question? What does xenon have an electron? Uh, electron Because xenon shell is so big that uh, it gets to the point where um, it can start forming bonds. So, there's more of an acceptance for, for, for electrons to come in and uh, share. Yeah, but for the most part, that whole group is, we can say, non-existent when it comes to sharing. All right? Um, let's look at auction. Auction is 3.44. I'll put this under auction. Here's oxygen. And uh, we'll keep that red. That's something different. Okay? So oxygen is uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p... How many electrons do you think that oxygen is willing to share now? Okay? How many electrons do you think it's willing to share? 
two. Right here, right here. Okay, oxygen. And then so if we look at our orbital notation, we can kind of see how many electrons it will need to come in and share to get to be like a noble gas. Okay? All right, we're running out of time. What I want to do is I want to give you three ways in which you can determine if something's ionic or covalent other than looking at if it's a metal, non-metal, or non-metal uh, non bonded to a non-metal, which are excellent ways to do that if you don't have numbers to look at. Okay? All right, three things we want to look at, okay? There's three types of bonding. There's ionic, there's nonpolar covalent. Remember, I talked about that earlier, that uh, when we look at nonpolar covalent, it means it's a compound. When you look at its molecule, uh, there's not different charges on the side of the molecule because it's nonpolar covalent bonding. And then we have polar covalent, meaning that there's an unequal share of an electron that is being shared. So we can have unequal shares. Nonpolar is going to be equal shares. And ionic bonding is going to be so big of a difference that we can't say it's sharing anymore, we, we know it's going to be forming of a cation and anion. So we know ionic is probably a metal, non-metal combination. What you look for is difference between of one, um, greater than 1.7 electronegativity between the two bonded atoms. I'm going to abbreviate difference. So difference in electron negativity of 1.7 or higher between two bonded atoms. The bottom two, I'm not going to write every word out because the, the only thing that changes is the number that we're looking at, the difference between. Okay? The next one is, and I'm just going to go ahead, uh, we're going to say uh, the number is going to be uh, from, one, uh, from 0 to 0.3. So, difference in electronegativity of 0 to 0.3 between two bonded atoms. And then the bottom one, if it's covalent, the difference is going to be from 1.3 to 1. I'm sorry, 0.3 to 1.7. All right, so the bigger the difference, the more ionic bonding character it has. If it has a big difference, then we consider it as a high ionic bonding percentage, okay? Uh, Nonpolar covalent, the more they're willing their share, the closer their, their electronegativities are. In polar covalent, there's not as an equal share, there's a little bit dip, bigger difference in their shares. So I'm going to give you four four of these to, or five of these before you go today to determine if they're ionic, ionically bonded, these two atoms when they come together, if they're a nonpolar covalent bond or if they're a polar, polar covalent bond, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, turn back to this page if you didn't get that all written down. Here are the five examples, okay? Magnesium and chlorine. 
Tell me if it's ionic, polar covalent, non-polar covalent. You have to take the higher electronegativity and subtract the lower one from it. Okay? Um, let's do this one. Uh, phosphorus and sulfur. Nitrogen and chlorine. Iodine and phosphorus. And barium and oxygen. So what you do is you look up their electronegativity, subtract them. The lower one, subtract from the higher one so it's positive. And then determine based upon these differences if they're ionic, nonpolar covalent bond, or polar, polar covalent bond. Okay? And that's all you need to do for tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to share with you your tests. Okay? I'm not going to go over any additional questions.